I think after Dr. Vandana Shiva has given such an eloquent, erudite, and overarching view of biodiversity in terms of its connection to human health as well as the global future, I really would find it very redundant to speak on that particular theme. However, I will be inspired by her to state some of my views, which resonate fully with her. Let me start off by at a point where she ended, when she talked about how dependent whole of the nature is on its interconnections. The naturalist John Muir remarked that when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. And therefore, any reductionist view of science is bound to end in failure and is likely to erode our approach towards betterment of health and humanity in general will suffer the consequences for that. But in terms of global health, if we are really looking at what global health is now in terms of a transition facing as challenges, we see a transition that has been described globally, but not uniformly. There are different parts of the world which are experiencing different health challenges, but some of these transitions have been accelerated in the low and middle income countries by the forces of delayed industrialization, growing urbanization, and the overwhelming forces of globalization. And therefore, it is not surprising to see that some of the disorders of maladapted modernity are now being heaped upon us in very large numbers. Nevertheless, if we are really looking at the full portfolio of global health challenges and try and relate them to how biodiversity's damage is also connected to them, then we see that Conventionally, the global health challenges are classified as infectious diseases, maternal and child health issues where they are compromised, and nutritional deficiencies which are interwoven into that, non-communicable diseases, mental health. All of them are related to imbalance between nature and human systems. And that we recognize quite well now. And therefore, the whole idea of ensuring that the biodiversity of nature is preserved and promoted and certainly not eroded is something that we ought to really look at as an important priority for global health, irrespective of the nature of health transition now, because the future of global health will depend upon reversing the conditions that are actually causing damage to human health and promoting elements that are likely to be supportive of a healthy human life across the entire course of life. Now, it's very simple that we do look at health, unfortunately, in a reductionist manner. But even when we look at what are the various injuries that are caused by loss of biodiversity, we can recognize that almost every part of human body and every part of human health is affected adversely. Ecosystems mitigate noise, air pollution, as well as heat, and loss of biodiversity inevitably alters those equations and does provide an opportunity for noise, air pollution, as well as heat to damage much more. Coming to health in terms of the microbiome, uh, 
Dr. Shiva has very clearly identified our, our gut health and the microbiome, which is distributed in different parts of our body, is very clearly connected to our health and how different disorders of different organ systems, which were seen as separate entities, now can all be linked, both in terms of the human body as a whole, but also consisting of the microbiome, which is very much now integrally part of our own body and becomes an important uh, ally if adequately promoted, but can turn against us if damaged. And even when microbiome and together they constitute the metagenome or the supergenome, which together react with external influences, including the diet, in order to shape our bodily responses. Therefore, it is with great humility that we must acknowledge that the human being who is supposed to be standing alone and aloft at the pinnacle of human civilization is not indeed alone, but is entirely dependent upon other living organisms, which are playing a very strong supportive role in terms of human sustenance. And therefore, if we damage that biodiversity and create conditions in which we are not permitting this kind of a coexistence, then we are likely to damage human health and put ourselves in peril. And we are seeing that very clearly in terms of the damage to the microbiome. Uh, Dr. Shiva has pointed out the mind-body connection, which is mediated through the microbiome. We recognize that there are a variety of disorders that are related to the microbiome uh, being disturbed, including the non-communicable diseases or the chronic diseases. And we recognize that basically a loss in the microbial diversity, which is often a result of loss in dietary diversity leads to excessive inflammation in the body, which can damage any part of the body and indeed thus damage most parts of the body, resulting in various clinical manifestations which may be packaged separately as individual organ diseases, but inevitably have the underlying mechanism in terms of pathophysiology of widespread inflammation. And that is, again, a result of the damage that we have caused to the microbiome. So whether it is uh, Alzheimer's, or whether it's Parkinsonism, whether it's dementia, whether it is diabetes, whether it is obesity, whether it is cardiovascular disease, we are seeing very many manifestations of this disturbance that we are causing in terms of the microbiome and its contribution to our human health. So there are many, very, very many diseases, including obesity, which are now being related to the microbiome. So we recognize that the underlying pathophysiological feature is inflammation. And inflammation can affect any part of the body and result in a variety of pathological manifestations. But what actually potentiates the inflammation or even precipitates it is the disturbance in the microbiome which is entirely dependent upon the nature of our food, apart from some other environmental exposures. And therefore, the our dietary diversity, which provides a better balance in terms of our microbiome, we is greatly disturbed when we have uh, the diversity that is provided uh, um, <coughs> damaged. Now, in terms of... Uh, the other uh, consequences that we are going to see of uh, losing the biodiversity, then we see that the food and agricultural systems are greatly affected and uh, they are important for health. And that is a very critical area where and across the entire life course, the nutrition right from the unborn infant to the elderly person the chain of nutrition, which is binding for health, is now going to be disturbed by the nature of nutrition, which is again dependent upon the diversity of the that we take. And we, I will deal a little more elaborately with the 
food and agricultural systems, but the zoonotic diseases, which again are very important elements that we are seeing now, where the biodiversity is destroyed or damaged, and the coherent connectivity between forestry and veterinary life and human life is destroyed by establishing conveyor belts through flagrant deforestation, which releases hitherto confined viruses, vectors, and other microbes into the veterinary population and from them into the human population or even directly into the human population. And if we are getting a very large number of zoonotic diseases now, with more than 70% of the new outbreaks being zoonotic in nature, it is not because animals have suddenly become malevolent towards human beings. It is because we have established the conveyor belts by our thoughtless actions in which we have damaged the harmonious interface between forestry and uh, wildlife, as well as veterinary and human populations and their habitat. So it is that that we need to really look at as something that we must remedy if we move ahead uh, to build a better world, which where in health is going to be more secure from the zoonotic diseases. Then we also recognize that we are destroying a large number of natural foods, whether it is the wild fruit or whether it is the, particularly the wild foods, uh, the wild fruit or the wild tubers or the wild grasses, we are completely destroying them in very many ways by destroying biodiversity. And even when we look at people who are eating meat, of course, uh, the livestock breeding itself is one of the major reasons why we are seeing the zoonotic diseases happening, uh, because that's part of the conveyor belt, the factory farming. But even those who eat meat are going to suffer not only because they are destroying nature, but because the quality of the meat that they're having through grain-fed animals is going to be very different from the meat that is coming from grass-fed animals. The nature of fatty acids in the meat is very different, and that is much more atherogenic when the animals are grain-fed. So again, not only are we destroying nature by destroying forestry and grasslands, but we are also inviting trouble by having a greater propensity for non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. Then we see that in terms of uh, uh, chronic diseases, there are a number of reasons why we are seeing a large number of these cardiovascular diabetes and other chronic diseases. Not only is the diet now more deficient in healthy nutrients, but it is also much more packed with unhealthy nutrients. And we are seeing this again as a result of cultural and culinary colonialism that is basically heaping unhealthy food products across the, com to the commercial determinants of health and nutrition across the world. If you only take the example of the Pacific Islands, what has happened there is very clear. There we have seen that while after the Second World War or even earlier than that, when basically a large number of food supplies started landing from the Western countries, particularly New Zealand or in the United States of America. And then later on, these were all packaged foods and they were extremely unhealthy, replacing the traditional diets. And then we had a large number of unhealthy foods that were not being consumed in the countries of origin, like turkey tails from the United States, mutton flaps, from Australia and New Zealand, landing up in the Pacific Islands, creating a huge wave of obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And when Samoa tried to correct it by preventing the import of uh, turkey tails from the United States, the World Trade Organization said it is anti-trade. Now, that is the kind of world that we have constructed, where not only we have destroyed the traditional food practices of various countries, but we are using trade uh, treaties in order to dump unhealthy foods unwillingly on unwilling populations and creating a huge amount of disease. And that is where global we 
uh, in terms of the health issues, uh, obviously, even in terms of epigenetics, if you are really looking at how our genes are going to be uh, expressing themselves, while we may be inheriting some genes, it is the environmental factors that help us express our genes. Size, particularly diet. There are so many dietary elements which help our genes to express in, a, in healthy ways. There are a number of dietary elements which down-regulate or up-regulate genes in a manner that there is ill health. And therefore, whether it is the microbiome or our own gene expression, we see that diet has a huge role to play and their dietary diversity matters a lot. And just to give you an example of how dietary diversity is very important, and how reductionism is likely to be injurious. Let us just look at what the experience in the world has been of the so-called antioxidants. It was previously known that if you had a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables, you are likely to be protected against diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cancer. But then of course, true to the tradition of reductionism, the various uh, antioxidant vitamins were isolated, whether it was vitamin E or vitamin C or uh, beta carotene, and they were put in uh, uh, pills and packages, pouches, and sold commercially. And they were used as nutritional supplements. And unlike the observational studies, epidemiological studies, which suggested that all these are likely to observational epidemiology, and that these have no protective effect whatsoever. On the other hand, the reality is, and that's now been well recognized, is that these clinical trials were so utterly reductionist that they started putting individual vitamins into the pills and pouches and expected to see the effect, whereas it was the interaction of the multiple phytonutrients in the natural foods that were, that were protective in their natural form and not in the synthetic form. And it is these interactions that were totally ignored in a reductionist approach, which completely eschewed a holistic appreciation of nature and the natural balances that are produced within the natural foods. And therefore, we now recognize very clearly that fresh fruit and vegetables do reduce inflammation, do promote good vascular health, and they prevent uh, chronic diseases. So it is these that we must recognize in terms of ensuring that our biodiversity is adequately protected in order to provide us all of these. And of course, coming to climate change, we, our food systems are destroying the environment and our environmental degradation is in turn damaging the food systems. And we are seeing a huge upsurge of vector-borne diseases, extreme weather events, heat effects, and uh, also, we are seeing the impact on nutrition. All of these are damaging to human health. And if we are really looking at what the impact of climate change is on food and nutrition systems, the staples will decrease quantitatively. For every, every one degree centigrade rise in temperature in South Asia and in Africa, which are already producing staples like rice and wheat, at the very upper limit of temperature tolerance, even a one degree rise in centigrade rise in temperature will result in a 10 degree, in 10% decrease in the yield of the staples. And in, qualitatively also, you will find a decrease in the content of uh, protein, zinc, and iron. And that will have catastrophic consequences for health as we move along. It has been postulated, it has been modeled by the Data Sciences Institute of the Columbia University that by 2050, if the global warming proceeds as it does now, India will have 49.6 million new zinc deficient uh, in individuals. It will have 38.2 million new protein deficient individuals and 396 million women will be iron deficient and 106.1 million children will be iron deficient. So even qualitatively, the nature of our nutrient content of our crops will be greatly damaged indeed. 
And of course, we must recognize that sustainable food systems depend upon the biodiversity of agricultural crops, fisheries, livestock, and forests. And unfortunately, we are damaging each one of them, including uh, the rising sea levels of climate change, destroying the coastal land crops through salination and uh, also uh, driving uh, the people uh, into nutritional deficiency. Uh, we are seeing uh, the potential allies of our health, like algal species, also being depleted and destroyed as a result of our uh, unfortunate uh, interventions uh, in terms of uh, 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 pumping in a large number of harmful chemicals. We are seeing a decrease in pollinator species, which again adversely affects food and agriculture, agricultural systems. And the decrease in pollinator species will have a catastrophic effect on the food security of the future, which invariably will impact upon health in all of its dimensions. So we are seeing the impact of so many areas of uh, uh, natural despoilation, uh, which are affecting bio, uh, biodiversity and in turn will impact upon health. We must also recognize that nature is a provider of medicines. A very large number of, apart from Ayurvedic medicines, which are going to be described, many of the allopathic medicines also have had plant origin. About 25% of the medicines, but 60% of the cancer medicines have come essentially from plant origins. And the more we destroy nature, the less we'll find we'll be able to benefit from the healing effect of nature, which has evolved along with us to heal the various maladies that we have been subjected to. So we do recognize that basically nature can live without us. We frequently talk of co-extinction, but it may not be that nature is going to uh, extinguish all species, just as we are ext extinguishing species, some of the nature will survive even without human beings. And we are seeing that even COVID-19 during the lockdowns, how nature again unexpectedly came back in, fair, in, in its beauty and its diversity in some unexpected areas. But what we must recognize is that whether we are going to have co-extinction or, or, or predominantly extinction of the human species through our own profligacy and foolishness, what we are really doing is counter evolutionary. Evolution itself built in this balance as many species have grown together, evolved together, balanced each other and have helped each other and have survived selectively feeding upon each other's needs and opportunities for conjoint survival. And what we are doing in terms of destroying biodiversity is counter evolutionary. We are challenging evolutionary and destroying nature and thereby in a sense, literally digging our, the grave of our own future. And as Dr. Shiva said, we are dealing with complex systems. We cannot have linear approaches. We need to look at solutions which are much more integrated in that sense, whether it is health or environment, each one of them is a complex system. And when all of them are combined together as they must be, then certainly we need to look at all of them in a unified way. And that is where biodiversity becomes absolutely important as the platform on which all of these complex systems operate in unison, in harmony. And therefore, when we are really looking at the commercial determinants of the environmental determinants of nature, we are really seeing this kind of a commercial capitalist assault on the survival of humanity by not only destroying biodiversity, but injuring human health in very many aspects. And that is where we must have what has been called the green reset. Uh, it's been said that we must really look at that. And therefore, we must access the vividity of nature through the vividata of nature. And therefore, we must build forward, as it's been said, after COVID-19. The slogan has been, build uh, back better. We should say, build forward better. But not only better, but broader, fairer, greener, bluer. But why only greener and bluer when we must really look at nature in all of its colors, resplendent, resplendent beauty of its various colors, 
So we must harness the rainbow of biodiversity and then really build back our build forward our entire future of humanity. And we know the perils of not heeding that warning, not heeding that caution, of being still profligate in the manner in which we are commercially and, uh, destroying biodiversity and causing huge perils, not only to the present generation in terms of human health, but causing human, huge intergenerational damage as well. Because what we are doing in terms of epigenetics, what we are doing in terms of uh, our natural resources hurts each individual human body, but is passed on also through the epigenetic pathways to the future generations, but also by destroying the collective resources of human society, we are also damaging the future of the children who are to come uh, through our damage to bio biodiversity. But these warnings are very clear. Never before in human history have we been so forewarned of the doom that awaits us if we continue on the way that we are organizing our society now and damaging the various pillars and crops that sustain us. But never again in human history, never before in human history, have we been so forearmed with the knowledge and the skills to alter that destiny. And therefore it's absolutely important for us to take a step back and see with clarity what needs to be done in terms of building forward that future of humanity where we can coexist in peace and prosperity with all the other living species on this earth and ensure that biodiversity is something that we can contribute to and profit from in that kind of a harmonious world set with the nature as the guide rather than we live in the foolish belief that humanity is the pinnacle of intelligence and therefore can shape the future of this planet that will not be. Thank you.